I always enjoy this. Um, one, the, one, of the, one thing I enjoyed very much about this issue and this article was that it had uh, Norman Mailer on the fight. And down here in little print, it had Frank Sinatra, cover of photography by Frank Sinatra. And I thought, this is the only time in my life that I will ever have billing over Frank Sinatra. So I treasured it. And by the way, I was absolutely right. It is the only time in my life. <laughs> but uh, I, I uh, must say I enjoyed this issue. And, and, and writing this piece was, uh, uh, wasn't fun at the time. It was the hardest work I ever did. But the fighters, Ollie and Fraser, fought with the... Uh, such incredible determination for 15 rounds. I, no one's ever seen a fight quite like that. I, don't, I mean, people can go to prize fights all their lives. They'll, ne they'll never see a fight where two men work that hard for 15 rounds. And uh, after it was all over, I had 36 hours to write the piece. I thought, they can work that hard. Well, I certainly can. <laughs> and uh, so I, I worked harder than I'd ever worked before. And I wrote, um, wrote the piece in, in that time, wrote 9,500 words. We're picking Muhammad Ali as one of life's heroes. Do you think it's an accurate description to call Ali a hero? Was he a hero to you or a hero in your eyes? Oh, you know, not only was, a he was he a hero, but I think obviously there have been greater men in the 20th century, although Ali will probably never forgive me for that remark. I think there have been, you know, many greater men, uh, obviously, uh, but no one was a greater hero than Ali. That is, I think Ali had more courage than uh, anyone I've ever known. And I say that because I don't think Ali was essentially a brave man. So I think bravery is something animal, just the way certain animals are brave, certain bulls are brave. They speak of brave bulls. So certain men are born braver than other men. I don't think Ali was born all that brave. I think he had enormous courage. In other words, he would apply his will to the bravery he had and get the maximum out of whatever bravery he had. Ali took more chances than anyone I've ever known. And uh, I always upped the ante, which was, took incredible courage. You know, if he was fighting a dangerous man, he made him more dangerous by insulting him. Ali had an extraordinary sense of, uh, of the psychology of violence. Uh, you know, absolutely brilliant man in terms of uh, uh, his warlike capacity to enter the psychology of an opponent and find the weak spot. So in that sense, he, yes, he's the hero of the 20th century. Not the greatest man by far, but, but the hero. Life magazine chose the astronauts as heroes. What is your opinion of the astronauts as heroes? I think they're, um, I think the astronauts are heroes for an altogether different reason than Ollie. Because after all, the astronauts sought to, to have as much knowledge as they could possibly uh, uh, acquire, brought to bear in every single problem they would face. And their attitude was that the more knowledge they had, the less fear they would feel. Uh, I, I think they're heroes because they were uh, young, uh, powerful, well-coordinated, intelligent, well-educated men who were, for the most part, reasonably happily married, who were daring uh, the, uh, the unknown. Uh, you know, they were taking the most tremendous chance anyone could take. They were going to the moon, which meant that they were uh, taking on uh, terrible dreams for five or ten years, getting ready for that adventure, uh, living with a sense of uh, inner excitement and danger as a part of their daily lives. In that sense, I think, I think it was heroic to, to, to dare to do this. They also were men who, could do, who were Stoics who could take enormous punishment. When I think of them as heroes, I think of them as uh, 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 heroes who bring out the uh, underpinning of Stoicism, because I can't imagine a more uncomfortable life than to be an astronaut. I mean, I mean it's bad enough to be in a plane for 12 hours, sitting in the mid-seat mid in, in tourist with two people on either side of you. Those, those astronauts sat in seats narrower than that with incredibly uncomfortable, bulky uh, spacesuits on. They practiced in them. They'd spend days training and wearing stuff like that. They'd uh, be put through centrifuges. They, uh, they had to learn enormous amounts of material, enough to just deaden the brain. Uh, feats of memory. Uh, they, they really uh, were tortured uh, and uh, went through it all because finally they had, they had a vision of what they wanted to do. I think when people have a vision of what they want to do and they're willing to accept torture and danger and difficulty and anxiety and instability and insecurity and all of that, then they're heroes. And if they're successful, that, that certifies it. Do you feel that life had a role in creating them? You know, life had an exclusive to all of their personal stories. Do you feel that life had any role in making these astronauts into heroes? Or do you have any opinion on that? A lot of people would say that, they, that the astronauts were heroes first 
and life did not have a role in making them heroes. But I don't know. I think if ever an event was made a media event, life certainly uh, contributed to the importance of the astronauts in American life. Life was the first to see that uh, they were really, uh, there was something extraordinary going on there that was worth an enormous amount of attention and from life's point of view a great deal of expense covering it. Uh, there's a story I love about two Jewish grandmothers meeting on the street and one of them is uh, pushing a baby carriage and the other looks and says, oh, what a beautiful grandchild you've got. And the first one says, that's nothing. Wait till I show you her picture. So in effect, I think life created the astronauts to a degree. They, they showed the astronauts picture and uh, underlined the, the importance of what they were doing. And I think also uh, the astronauts themselves became uh, uh, self-conscious in a way that if, if you're made of heroic stature, sometimes the fact that the spotlight is on you uh, adds to uh, the possibility of becoming more and more of a hero. Uh, Another of life's heroes, and I know it, he, it seems to me he is your hero, is Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway is, is a hero to me because uh, I love what I learned from his work. I think half the American writers alive, and I would include half the American writers alive who happen to be women, uh, who read Hemingway have been enormously affected by his work. He taught us all how to write. In that sense, he was more our teacher and our father, our spiritual father, than a hero. I think, again, though, if I, I was, he exemplifies that quality of uh, courage rather than bravery. If you study his life, there's an enormous emphasis in his life on keeping that courage up. He, he was the last man in the world to see his courage as automatic. And I think he finally, he died trying to keep his courage up. I, I often suspected that maybe for years he discovered that if he played Russian roulette with himself, uh, he could recover for a period from his depressions and his terrors. So that I think he, perhaps he used to go in each night, put a shotgun in his mouth, start to pull the trigger, go in further and further to pull the trigger and then give, stop. And then one, one night it went off because he seemed to be in no depression the night he killed himself. It's possible he'd wake up in the middle of the night and start playing these games with himself. I don't think it was so much as a hero because finally he committed suicide and left us all there. He, cre he left a great shock in American letters. None of us have been the same since he committed suicide. I guess above all others, Life Magazine thought that Winston Churchill seemed to be life's greatest hero. I mean, they called him the greatest figure of history in 50 years. What is your assessment of Winston Churchill as a hero? Winston Churchill was one of three heroes who uh, had a most triangular relationship. One of them was Churchill, one was Roosevelt, and the other was Stalin. Now, Stalin was an awful man, terrible man. He was also a great man. He uh, made some of the worst errors that any human beings ever made, and millions of people died for those errors. Uh, but he also had uh, the guts of the gods, and he was a hero. Roosevelt was a hero. Churchill was a hero. I, rarely in history do you find three heroes on one side in a war. Uh, Churchill is the most agreeable to some of the three heroes. Uh, Roosevelt we revere, those of us who do, and those of us who still hate him, still hate him. Uh, I happen to revere him, but, but Roosevelt is nearer to us. There was something about Churchill that was Great Britain. It was marvelous. It was British panache. It was the fact that Churchill could uh, drink a bottle of brandy a day and smoke a box of cigars and somehow stay hale and hearty. He, uh, he had cause. He actually, I don't know enough about history itself to say where he was uh, a wise leader and where he, he was a bit of a fool, but I think Churchill made some enormous errors and uh, probably if one took a, a hard, cynical view of his role in the war, he was the most conservative of these three heroes, the one least interested in winning the war. Far more than winning the war, he wanted uh, Russia to uh, bl bl bloody itself, to bleed itself. He wanted Russia to be weakened by that war, and he wanted to preserve the British Empire. Last on his uh, shopping list was, was winning that war. However, he was, he was a remarkably resourceful man, uh, brilliant on the one hand, a rogue on the other. Uh, he he, I think one reason he definitely was a hero, at least he is to me, when all is said, is he spoke the best language of any political leader in the last 200 years, at least in the English language. And those remarkable phrases uh, unified a nation, and after all, if you live with language all your life and you work with it, that's what you want language to do. We've talked about all of these heroes. What I would like to know from you is, 
What is your definition of a hero? What are the ingredients of a hero? It's hard to uh, come up with a formula of, you know, what is a hero? I think one element that has to be there is that the man or the woman, if we're speaking of heroines, has to uh, be, become more than anyone would ever expect that they would become. They have to transcend themselves at least once in their lives and usually many times. And heroes have to be able to take huge strain. There are any number of people who are virtuous or brilliant or daring, but a hero has to have the ability to um, take consecutive dares, very often daily for a period of years, and live with it and somehow transcend the uh, anxiety of that. Heroes are people who, on a huge scale, uh, rise above their own anxiety and uh, so succeed in changing the world. I think a hero at whatever level, and you can have a block hero as well as a world hero, but I think a hero has to change the history of their environment. Uh, if they're a, a hero on a large political scale, then they change the history of their nation. If they're a local hero, then they, uh, they better something in the environment around them or they uh, alter something. But it isn't just a matter of doing it through slow, patient, decent work. Those, those can be very decent people, good people. A hero does it, uh, a, one always assumes that there's an element of the dramatic in what a hero does. They can be sly, they can be subtle, they can be patient, they can work for years at their purposes, but they also have to have uh, something absolutely bold in their vision. Uh, the, the, what is not before their eyes has to be more real to them than what is. What was Life Magazine's impact on race? I, there's little I can say there because I wasn't really uh, <coughs> following life that closely in those years. I have a general impression that they uh, gave a great deal of co uh, coverage to uh, Little Rock and to uh, Martin Luther King. And uh, so I think they probably had a positive aspect there. But I think there's so many people who can say more about it. What about Martin Luther King as a hero? Martin Luther King was a hero. And um, I'll speak of living with uh, great anxiety day after day, year after year, that man had to live in terror of being killed uh, every day of his life and not show it. And in fact, uh, if he had any paranoia in that direction, I'm sure he did, uh, he was justified. It wasn't paranoia at all. It was acumen. Uh, he knew he was in danger of his life every day. I met him once in New York. He was in for an evening and uh, some people had passed the word and we went up to Harlem. I think it was somewhere around 135th Street. In those days, it was less extraordinary to go up to Harlem. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting him, and he was just a mild, pleasant man. Uh, you felt you were meeting a, a cordial, decent black minister. Uh, he, was, he always had that uh, attractive side to him physically. It was obvious he was also a man who would be attractive to women. There was just something so agreeable and gentle and warm and strong about him that you felt. But he was, uh, he was not a man you say, oh, there's a hero when you met him. Uh, I remember being surprised at how, um, uh, not average, that's not the word, but at how um, uh, how agreeable and easy it was to talk to him, and uh, uh, his charisma had a gentle glow about it. It, it wasn't uh, full of uh, lightning and sharp shafts. What about you? Well, your very first book was written about World War II. Have, do you have any? Did life's coverage of World War II? Did any of the pictures, anything, have any influence on your writing? I remember that I used to be angry at, at life and time during the war because they used to make it more glamorous than my end of the war. Uh, I used to be jealous. The, their coverage of the Pacific was pretty good, but their coverage of Europe was far better and far more extensive. And, and indeed, if I'd had any choice, I would have been in Europe myself. I used to think I'm in the wrong war in the wrong place. The war I was in was such a grim, dull, essentially dirty war. What I mean was you just physically, you were dirty all the time. You were covered with mud. Your uniforms were rank. You know, there were no places to bathe. It was just a dull, dirty, smelly, uninteresting war. And I used to hate Life magazine because it, it made the war look so good. In the early issues of Life, printed under the Life logo, were the words, America's most important editorial force. When you were around in those days and reading Life, was it? Do you agree with that assessment that Life had this editorial impact on the world, on its readership? I think Life had not so much editorial impact on uh, its readership as a uh, sensuous impact, or let me say, I think life changed values in American life to, to a certain degree, as much as a magazine can. And in that sense, if you want to say that it was editorial, yes, but they weren't changing people's minds because of their editorials. 
Their editorials used to be at a high level, it used to be a bit of a joke to me because there they were on one page and they pontificated. And in those days, the loose magazines weren't as close to the uh, reality of things as they are today. And they used to pontificate outrageously and egregiously. It used to irritate the hell out of me. So I wasn't fond of life until I started working for it and discovered there were a lot of nice guys and there and a lot of nice ladies and they were all helping me a lot. And they were very decent people to work with. So I, got to, I became fond of life because of the people I worked with. But I'd never particularly liked life in the old days. I'd always felt it was a little bit smug and it uh, tended to uh, uh, have uh, much too much certainty as all the loose magazines did before the war and right after the war about how Americans should live. Life had an influence on the way people lived. That was the beginning, I think, of a huge influence th that you would now, we now speak of as visual. People take their mores today from television. They uh, dress like uh, the, the so-called heroes and heroines that they identify with on TV soap operas and what have you. Uh, they pick up their sense of chic from TV. Uh, life was the first uh, major organ of the media to affect people visually, I think. In that sense, I think it had a huge impact on American life. But I would not call it editorial so much as uh, 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 whatever visual suggestion. I, uh, words fail me. No, I think that's very good. My last question is, what do you think is the lasting importance of Life magazine? I think life will uh, have a, dare I say it, a second life in libraries. And given video entertainment these days, it'll be packaged and put out in uh, cassettes and kids of the future won't go to libraries, they'll look at it on their TV screen, which won't be the same thing. But I think if people will still pick up old copies of life in libraries and leaf through them, that there'll be a marvelous uh, re uh, 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 marvelous, uh, bring a marvelous bouquet of the past. And uh, uh, one will be able to steep oneself in certain periods. One will get a false impression of it, but then any time one goes through any history book, one gets a false impression of the past. And after all, your past is not my past. And so uh, that doesn't really matter. But one will get some notion of somebody's conception of what the present was at a time in the past. And that's as near as we can ever come to the past.